Okay, so good afternoon. My name's Sam uh, and I'm a senior lecturer in the Dyson School of Design Engineering uh, and part of the Electrochemical Science and Engineering group, as well as having my own group in the Dyson School, the TLDR group, Tools for Learning, Design and Research. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about EIS, Electrochemical Impedance Spectroscopy. Uh, and my aim is to give you a an introduction to it in a way that you've not seen before. So hopefully it's somewhat distinct from the textbooks. So if you like the textbooks, then you're already set. But if you found them a bit confusing, then hopefully I can pitch it to you in a slightly different way uh, that, that you will be able to hang on to. Uh, so we're going to start from the very beginning. Um, and I have to try and remember, and if I don't, someone please interrupt me to, we should take a break at some point, at least one, uh, so that we can all refresh our brains. Okay, so this is just for my sake, just to remind me of all the things I want to mention today. So don't worry about that. What are we doing? OK, there's there's electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, but actually there's just impedance spectroscopy in general. And this can apply to mechanical systems or audio systems. A range of systems show impedance like behaviors. And the general idea is we are applying a small periodic stimulation signal and we're going to measure the response of that signal. So usually, therefore, in electrochemical systems, we apply a small stimulation voltage signal, and it's periodic here, and we might measure a small current signal as the response. Now, you can also do the inverse of that. You could you could stimulate it with a current and measure the voltage, okay? But more often than not, you stimulate with the voltage and measure a current. A few questions before we look into the analysis, because I, I suspect for the audience, many of you have either done impedance or seen some impedance or seen a bunch of Nyquist plots and all these bits. And I, I'm, I'm really keen to start from the very beginning of, of what we're doing and why to make sure that we're all on the same page. So first question from perspective of linearity, you may have heard this expression in the context of impedance. Why do we use a small signal? OK. And the answer is because electrochemical systems aren't linear, i.e. if you've got a system where for a particular voltage it gives a particular current. If you double the voltage, you wouldn't usually expect to get double the current. OK, they are often very nonlinear. But if you give it a very small signal, i.e. the amplitude of your sine wave is nice and small, so it's only traveling a short sort of distance in the voltage range, then you can say roughly, approximately, the response will be linear. So analysis of linear systems, as you might imagine, is much more, much easier than the analysis of nonlinear systems. And so that's why we take this approach, a nice small signal so that you can approximate the response as a linear response to that signal. OK, and so we often would call this a pseudo linear response, but not too small. OK, and this is a classic sort of engineering scenario. You've got con fighting constraints. One of your constraints says don't make it too big, otherwise it will be nonlinear. And on the other side, don't make it too small, otherwise you'll have a signal to noise problem. You won't be able to generate reliably that kind of small signal and you won't be able to measure reliably the response from the system. So you've got a compromise there and that's why you pay uh, good money for uh, high quality impedance equipment because it can generate small signals and measure them accurately across a wide range. The big model is this. Uh, when I've spoken to lots of people about impedance, whether it's, uh, you know, the beginning of their first year of their CDT or during their PhD viva, the big model seems to come from the fact that impedance is not the ratio of voltage and current in, in time. It's voltage and current in frequency. And we're going to come back to that uh, about halfway through. Uh, and hopefully that's going to be a bit of a helpful revelation to some of you. So we've got a set of idealized components. OK, they are idealized. They don't exist in reality. No things actually behave quite like this. OK, but they're very helpful models that we can put in our system and they do often represent reality quite well in many scenarios. So resistors, and you can see the little symbol on the left, a little squiggly line. Uh, resistors, and they have resistance R measured in ohms. Capacitors with capacitance C measured in farads. And in each case on the right hand side, I'm giving their relationship to voltage. 
So you all have heard of V equals IR, and you also should be equally familiar with the voltage relationship to a capacitor, which is that the voltage is one over capacitance uh, multiplied by the integral of the current, i.e. the amount of uh, charge that's been moved or stored. And lastly, inductance, with inductance L, which is has the units of Henry's. And uh, the relationship to voltage here is the inductance multiplied by the derivative of the current. So the capacitors are the integral of the current and the inductors are the derivative of the current. And here's a sort of very conventional representation. It's sort of bringing together all the bits I've just shown. Here's a simple series circuit with all three of those components represented. You've got some kind of voltage uh, signal and it's generating a current in the circuit in the loop. And the result of those three components is that when you put in a known voltage, you get a measured current out and it might have a change in amplitude and a change in uh, phase depending on the values of R, L, and C. And phase, as you can see from that diagram, is the degree to which the peaks line up with the peaks and the troughs lined up with the troughs. And so you can be uh, in phase or you can be in anti-phase where the peaks line up with the troughs between the voltage and the current and anything in between. As I say, all of the components are idealizations including the wires. So we don't often don't talk about the wires in impedance diagrams. They're, they're the bits, they're just the black lines that connect all the components together. And we assume those to have uh, perfect electronic conductivity or, or zero resistance and certainly no uh, reactance, reactance is capacitance or inductance. But that's not even true. OK, and so I just want to like keep sowing in your mind this idea that these are models. These are simplified representations that do not describe reality exactly, but they describe reality conveniently, which is a very useful thing to do. So even wires actually have resistance as a function of frequency due to something called the skin effect, where you get sort of eddy currents in your flows of electrons inside the wire, which I, I blew my mind when I found that out. And so here you've got an example of a copper wire, and depending on the frequency, it changes, you know, a material property resistivity, it changes as a function of frequency. And of course, also these things will change as a function of temperature. Wires, as any of you have done impedance, also often have a degree of inductance. And if you have long wires because you've got a big rig, then you can measure quite significant inductance, which can be a pain. So all of the components are simplified idealizations, but they're very helpful. The key framing that I'd like you to, to make use of today are relating impedance in electrochemical systems to other physical analogies, which I consider to be easier to um, visualize. And I'm sure many of you have heard them before. So the first one is the, the spring mass damper trolley system. You've got a trolley, it's on wheels, frictionless wheels, and it's attached to a wall on one side with a spring of stiffness K, a damper of damping constant C, and the trolley itself has a mass M and it moves back and forth in direction X, right? It's constrained by that spring. And so this thing will have a sort of oscillation frequency. So it will move back and forth. And if it's got damping, that energy will gradually leave the system a bit like air resistance and the thing will gradually oscillate back towards the middle position. And you may remember from your undergraduate mathematics that this has this second order ordinary differential equation where we say the mass times the acceleration, where acceleration is x double dash, or the second derivative of position, mass times acceleration plus damping times speed, which is the first derivative of position, plus spring stiffness times position equals the forcing term, which is a function of time. So x, x prime and x double prime are all also functions of time. It's a bit messy to put them all there. So all of the terms in this equation end up with the units of force. So as you know, F equals MA, so mass times acceleration is a force, damping times speed is a force, stiffness times position is a force. And so this is a second order ODE heterogeneous because it's got a function on the right-hand side and it describes this trolley. And I, and hopefully some of you, can look at that system and have a bit of a feel for how it's gonna behave. So if I move the trolley to the right, and let me turn on my laser pointer, if I drag this trolley to the right over here and let it go, 
you should all sort of have a feeling that it's going to get dragged back to the left again by the spring, but this damper is going to sort of slow down the rate at which it gets uh, dragged back. And for those of you who remember this in a bit more detail, depending on the ratio of these three uh, components, or depending on the balance of these three uh, parameters, will determine whether this thing oscillates forever, or oscillates a bit and gradually slows down, or really gently moves back to the middle, or really slowly creeps back to the middle as if it's moving through honey. Let me show you a second system. This is water in a pipe. OK, and you've got water and it's moving through a constriction, which is sort of uh, a narrowing in the pipe, which maybe causes a bit of turbulence or something. And it, it can cause the pipe, pipe to sort of heat up in that region and, and lose energy. You've got a water wheel, which as the water flows past it, this water wheel gains momentum or sort of it has rotational inertia. So it likes to keep going in the same direction. And then lastly, you've got a little membrane that is totally across the whole pipe and it sort of blows up like a like a balloon. So as you flow in one direction, this membrane gradually and it's got stiffness pulling it in one direction and then it can ping back in the other direction. This system has an equation like this where I've given V is my little volume of displaced water. So we can say that alpha is a bit like M. And M is the inertia of the trolley, and alpha can be the inertia of our little water wheel. Beta is a bit like C. C was our damping. Depending on how fast you go is how much energy you lose or how much force you require to move through that space. So beta relates to our constriction in our pipe. And lastly, gamma is a bit like K, i.e. the stiffness, and this one's a very obvious one. The stiffness in our sort of blocking elastic membrane is a bit like the stiffness in your spring, okay? And now instead of a force, because you're in a pipe, it's a force per unit area, so it's a pressure. So all of these have units of pressure. Now we're back to the one that we're really interested in today, the inductor resistor capacitor uh, series circuit. And we can look at that and say, okay, uh, what do we learn by knowing that this is the second order heterogeneous ODE that describes it, what do we learn by drawing an analogy to these other two systems? Well, let's start with the middle term. R multiplied by Q prime equals V. Well, you should be able to sort of work out by deduction that Q prime is clearly I, is clearly the current. So this is V equals IR is the middle term, okay? And so what is Q? Q is displaced charge, okay? So initially, imagine all the electrons in your circuit are in some initial position. And if I move the current a little bit, if I let the current flow a little bit, you can compare where they are now to where they were. That's the sort of amount of distance your charge has been displaced by. So Q is displaced charge. And it's very much like displaced volume of water or displaced position of trolley. And so it's the first time derivative of the, the displacement of charge. So it's just the current. So resistance times current is voltage. What about the other two terms here? Let's look at the first one, uh, L Q double prime. So this is L times the second derivative of displaced charge, which is the first derivative of the current. So L times the first derivative of current equals V. And this one is like M, the mass of the trolley. So you can think of an inductor as being like momentum in your circuit, right? So and what's momentum like? Well, when you've got a current flowing, and it's flowing along in one direction, and you suddenly give it a signal to do something else, it wants to keep going how it was, okay? It takes a while to slow down and change course. That's momentum. Conversely, this term over here, C to the minus one times Q, notice there's something a little bit annoying here. I've given you K for spring stiffness, gamma for membrane stiffness, but C to the minus one for our capacitor I'm afraid, as with a few things that we're going to talk about today, that's just convention. So we could have defined a different parameter that was, you know, not to the minus one, but just 
you know, just a straight up coefficient. But by convention, we've defined the parameter to be one over that convention seen in the other two systems. So you've got C to the minus one. So C is like the inverse of stiffness. OK, so when C is very, very large, it's like having a very, very soft spring attached to your mass, i.e. if your spring is very soft, you don't even see it there at all. Whereas when the C is very, very small, it's like having a very stiff spring and therefore it really blocks the current from going through at all. So I hope you can keep these analogies in your mind between these idealized circuit components, L, R and C, and the components of either the spring mass damper or the waterfill plug membrane system. Because uh, as I say, I, I deal with this maths quite a lot and I find this super useful to keep in mind. So let's stick with the one that we're most interested in and let's deliberately reframe it back to something slightly more familiar. Let's forget about displaced charge, which is Q, and think about current. OK, so all I'm doing is I've replaced Q prime with I, Q double prime with DI by DT and Q with the integral of I with respect to T. OK, and that is something that's going to turn out to be quite important in, in, in making a convenient description of our model. So let's try and extract V impedance. OK, so I've talked about resistance, but I haven't really mentioned impedance. And I want you to walk through this analysis with me. So I, I, I've, you know, I'm teaching the maths course at the moment in my department, and I have found as much as I enjoy writing on an iPad that actually the number of mistakes and the clarity of my handwriting are not good enough. So I've I've painstakingly made this animation by animation, so hopefully that works a bit better. There's a lot of notation here. Here we've got the same equation again, OK? But what if I want to just have a resistor? Well, a system, a circuit with just a resistor is a circuit where essentially we can imagine that L was zero, OK? And C to the minus one was zero, i.e. C has gone off to infinity, right? That would make this term here disappear and it would make this term here disappear and it would give us r times i equals v which you should all be familiar with so here it is uh, i've got this displaced charge notation which we're going to disappear in a minute and what we're going to do as i showed in the early slide is replace my mystery v is a function of t function with a specified uh, sinusoidal stimulation. So it's going to have amplitude V naught, some specified voltage amplitude. It's going to have frequency omega, some rotational frequency, angular frequency, and it's a sine wave, and so it's a function of T. I'm just going to substitute that in and rearrange. Okay, so I now have an expression for the current in my system as a function of time. Q prime, which is just I, equals V0 over R uh, times sine omega T. OK, very obviously this is the simplest one, so it all seems very fine. And what you know, what you've seen is that Z equals V over I, which in my case is V over Q prime. Uh, and so we just sub in all the things we know. V was V0 sine omega T and Q prime, as we've just found, was V0 over R sine omega T. And Quite clearly, almost everything just cancels out and we end up with one over one over R, which is just R. So it looks like we've progressed through a sort of visual understanding to a mathematical ODE type description, and we can reduce this to the thing that we're after, which is the impedance. What is the impedance of a system? Obviously, this one is an easy one. So let's look at another scenario, scenario two just a capacitor. So we we'll start with the full equation and once again say, OK, if we want just a capacitor, then we'll have, we'll set L to zero, we'll set R to zero, and we'll keep C to the minus one as C to the minus one. Okay, it's some unknown value of C, it's just a capacitor. If we do that, our equation reduces to this, C to the minus one Q equals V as a function of T. Uh, and we're going to choose uh, our same stimulation function, V0 sine omega T, and solve. Well, if I just rearrange the equation above, 
I get Q on its own, and that says to me the displaced charge equals CV naught sine omega t. But if I want the impedance, then I want the derivative of displaced charge. I want the current. So I have to differentiate this thing with respect to time. And that's not hard at all, of course. Sine omega t differentiates to omega cos omega t. Uh, and now I can do the same thing again. Z equals V over I, which equals V over Q prime which equals the things we just found as a ratio, which equals something wrong, right? Z equals one over C omega multiplied by tan omega T. As Picard is saying here, that is not how this works. That is not how any of this works, okay? Z is not the ratio of V of T over I of T, okay? That's not what it is. Clearly, you know, by pursuing this method, what we've got is some very strange thing that says, well, th this is the, our impedance of our system, what we've been calling Z, is a function of time. I don't think that's correct, right? So it's saying that our, you know, and also it's it's a tan function, a very strange function with all these sort of discontinuities in it. Okay, so something's gone wrong here, and I think it's the thing that's caused a lot of people confusion in this topic. So let's undo that confusion. The model is this. Z does not equal V as a function of T over I as a function of T. Z is this V tilde as a function of omega divided by I tilde as a function of omega. It's the voltage as a function of frequency divided by the current as a function of frequency. Why have I got these little tildes there, the little wiggles over the top of these variables? And the answer is it's because I've, I've done something to them. Uh, and what I've done to them is I have Fourier transformed them, okay? I'm no longer looking at them in the time domain, I'm looking at them in the frequency domain. What does that mean? Okay. I, I suspect almost all of you will have at least heard of Fourier transforms before, most of you would have done some Fourier transforms before and your undergrad, and probably almost all of you would have forgotten how to do a Fourier transform, and that's fine. We don't need to remember how to do them, but we need to not be intimidated by them. So this is the Fourier transform equation, and it does look quite intimidating. Do not panic, we're not gonna use it. I'm just gonna give you four results from it that will make our lives spectacularly easier and bring all of these elements together. So the first result is, and actually just to look at that first line for a second, just from a notational perspective, you can see that I've got squiggly F or curly F, okay? And that's me just saying, what is the Fourier transform of X of T, some function X of time, okay? And to find that, I would do the integral between plus and minus infinity of that function multiplied by this interesting thing, E to the minus I omega T, all with respect to DT. And one way of writing the output, you know, it doesn't mean I've, I haven't worked it out, but one way of writing down that I have applied a Fourier transform to X of T is to write X tilde of omega. Okay, that's just me saying to myself that X tilde is the Fourier transform of X. So it's nice to use the same symbol and you put a little tilde. Some people use capital letters instead, so they use capital X. It doesn't matter which one you do. I quite like the tilde. So what is the Fourier transform of the first time derivative of x. Okay, the Fourier transform of the first time derivative of x. Well, it turns out if you sub it in to that equation there, it is i omega times x tilde. So something there's something quite profound there, and I don't want to dwell too much on the Fourier bit. You know, I think that'll be an individual preferences type thing where you might go away on your own and, and remind yourself about exactly what's going on. But something quite profound that is going on there is that calculus has turned into multiplying by a coefficient. So, so differentiation in this case has become multiply your transformed function by i omega, where omega is the frequency and i is the square root of minus one. Okay, i is the, 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 the complex coefficient, the complex unit. So, the Fourier transform of the first time derivative of some function x is just i omega x tilde. Therefore, unsurprisingly, oh, 
hold on, there should be a little minus sign there just to keep everyone on their toes. Therefore, the second time derivative of this function is minus omega squared x tilde. And if you're struggling to see why that is, well, just differentiate the first derivative again, i.e. just multiply by i omega again. If you multiply by omega again, i times i is just minus one, and omega times omega is just omega squared. So this is minus omega squared x tilde. Again, very handy. Calculus traditionally, you know, a bit of a pain in the Fourier world, in the Fourier domain, very straightforward. The third identity to keep in mind is that integration is exactly as easy as you might hope it would be. It's just divide by i omega. OK, so differentiation is multiplied by omega. Integration is dividing by i omega. And the last one is just a demonstration of the fact that the Fourier transform is a linear operation. So the Fourier transform of coefficient a times function x plus coefficient b times function y is a times x tilde plus b times y tilde, i.e. you can break up a, you can break up that addition, so it's just the Fourier of ax plus the Fourier of by, and also you can take the coefficients out. So it's a times the Fourier of x plus b times the Fourier of y. So that linearity property is going to come in really handy as well. It means you can break up your big ODE into all its separate bits. So we just need to keep those in mind. Those are going to come up. Those are going to be the explanation that links together the representations of impedance that you would have seen in papers to this mechanical, physical ODE type model that I showed you a few slides ago. So let's have another go at our capacitor. Now that we've realized that the method that we showed first, that we managed to succeed with the resistor on, didn't work with the capacitor, can we have a go at the capacitor with our new Fourier knowledge. So let's Fourier transform our system. Using our knowledge of linearity, we just take all the three coefficients out and Fourier transform each term separately. And what we get is this. OK, uh, we can see that I have kept Q and turned it into Q tilde, the Fourier transform version of Q. The coefficients all stay the same, but I've now got I omega, where q prime was, and minus omega squared, where q double prime was. And my v has also turned into a, a v tilde. So let's try again with our capacitor. If I want a capacitor, then I set L to zero, I set R to zero, and I set C minus one to C to the minus one. Okay, plug it in and, and delete the terms that aren't relevant. I just get C to the minus one multiplied by q tilde is v. So once again, I can say that my function V of T, I'm going to choose to be V naught sine omega T, but it doesn't actually matter at this point. I don't need to put in the actual function. I can just put in my V tilde and say, well, that, that is the function that I'm going to use. OK. And uh, all I've done is move that C to the minus one. I've multiplied both sides by C. OK. And I've, I've you know, you can see I've turned the Fourier transform of V into just V tilde. As you know, to get the impedance, I don't want the ratio of V and I. I want firstly, uh, I don't want the ratio of V and Q. I want the ratio of V and I, or more specifically, V tilde over I tilde. So if I want not Q tilde, but Q prime tilde, then as you know, all I do is multiply by I omega. OK, all I do is multiply by I omega, and that is the same as differentiation. So my impedance is V tilde over I tilde or V tilde over Q prime tilde. And that's just the ratio of these things we've just found. And what you end up with is one over C. Apologies, a little typo there as well. Get rid of that C. V, the stimulating frequency was just, um, voltage was just V prime tilde. Okay. Now, hopefully lots of you will recognize the final right hand side of the final equation. The impedance, this notion, this thing Z of just a capacitor 
is 1 over i omega c. Okay, 1 over i omega c. Now you're making progress. Now you've finally got like a piece of the puzzle that you couldn't access. You, you really can't access this without Fourier transforms unless there are some ways to sort of fudge it that aren't really what's going on. But now you are moving forward. So you've got the sort of agreement of Picard here. Actually, we can make life even easier again. OK. This is just a capacitor take three. OK, really, really hammering it to death now. I find that, well, I think you can all agree that we'd rather work with currents than whatever a displaced charge is. And so that's a very easy substitution, right? Q prime becomes I, Q double prime is just I prime, and Q is the integral of I. So not a very complicated thing to have done. I'm just slightly reframing the discussion. And once again, I can do the Fourier transforms of those that one derivative and that one integral, and I end up with this. Uh, it's the same equation, but now I've Fourier transformed it. And once again, if I want to solve for the capacitor, so the same problem as I did last time, then I just set the coefficients to what they need to be. And quite straightforwardly, most of the terms disappear, or the first two terms disappear. And now all I've got to do to get Z is just move that I over to the other side, right? Divide both sides by I tilde. So we could once again talk about the fact that our stimulating signal is V naught sine omega T. But again, why, why bother? It doesn't matter. We, we, we know it's going to cancel out, uh, so it doesn't make any difference. So that's an even faster way to get to your uh, impedance value. If you're working with I to begin with, or the uh, the frequent the Fourier transform of um, the current, then you don't even need to do that differential or derivative step again. Now you're really cooking. Now we've got to the point where actually we are on the cusp of being able to analyze absolutely any circuit. I need to give you about three more pieces of information, and you have all the maths needed for almost all circuits. Okay. Um, it's possibly a slight exaggeration, but not far away, right? All, 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 the, all the classics. So, so far we've just analysed, in fact, uh, are there any questions? So I, I just want to check, right, that, that's like a key little moment just there. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, they're welcome to ask out loud or put it in the chat. I think one of the challenges will be that, that as ever with, with a network, you've got a very diverse group of uh, people watching. So some will have lots of experience of impedance and some will have almost none. Uh, but you're welcome to ask absolutely anything. OK, I've got the chat in front of me, so I can see that either people are, are with me or, or too far away to ask a question. Uh, so we press on. OK, so you've done a resistor and you've done a capacitor and you recognise the significance of being in the frequency domain. I didn't mention the fact that why does the resistor work? Well, the resistor is not a function of frequency anyway. So you get away with it without moving to the frequency domain with a resistor, but it would still work in the frequency domain, of course. What about two components in series? Well, in series, you just add them up. OK, so if I want R and C in series, then here's my nice Fourier transformed current equation. And once again, I'm going to pick my coefficients to solve the system I'm interested in. So put L to zero, R to R, C to the minus one to C to the minus one. And here we go. So I've just thrown away the first term because I set L to zero. And at this point, solving basically is just factorizing. So, you know, I've just taken all the coefficients in front of the uh, the Fourier current, right? The uh, I tilde. Um, and then I just divide both sides by I tilde. And I get that. And there's always endless sort of algebraic rearrangement that you can do once you've got that. So my impedance of a resistor and a capacitor in series is R plus one over I omega C. That's it. It is often quite helpful to rearrange things to be a single fraction. That turns out to be quite helpful for certain scenarios. So uh, we can do that. So uh, you know, I don't need to walk through every step of the algebra, but that's not too hard to do. 
And also, it's often good practice to realize your denominator, i.e., don't have any complex numbers on the bottom of your fraction. And all I do there is multiply top and bottom by i, and that, that, that solves that problem. And then multiply top and bottom by minus one as well to clean up. OK, so I now have an expression for the impedance of a series resistor and, and capacitor. And what you can see is it's a function of omega. That's one thing. It's also a, it's, it's, a, it's got a real component and a complex component. OK, and as I'm sure many of you recognize already, you know, when we come to analyzing these things, we know that we're dealing with complex numbers and we're going to want to plot them, which we're going to talk about later today. Um, and so. But it's not a function of time. Time has disappeared. When we do our Fourier transform, time sort of evaporates out of it through the integration process. So it's just a function of frequency. It is a value parameterized in terms of frequency, and it's a function of your various circuit components coefficients. So this is like a little micro recap of all the steps we just walked through. I hopefully convinced you of why we need to Fourier transform our nice second order displaced charge ODE. But actually, life gets a bit easier if instead of thinking about displaced charge, you think about current. So I just did a little substitution, I equals Q prime. And because of linearity, we can split it up into all these separate bits. And because of the way that calculus works in Fourier space, we can actually just factorize it out. So we can factorize I tilde out of each of those bits and say that, our new description of that of the first line, if you will, is that we've got the sum of three series components in this case, multiplied by the Fourier transform of the current equals the Fourier transform of the voltage. OK, and clearly to get the, the impedance is just the thing in the bracket because I just would divide both sides by I tilde to get it. Now, you probably recognize each of those terms in the bracket. And that's because they are the sort of well, uh, well used or well known um, impedance formulations or sort of simplified forms of the impedance formulations for those three classic idealized components, R, C and L. OK, so we've moved through that process and you you now have just some like Lego bricks, basically, you now have three little bits of maths that plug together to give you a very wide range of circuits. OK, if you've got a resistor and it's in series with an inductor, I can tell you straight off that the, in, that the impedance of that circuit is going to be R plus J omega L. I've switched from J to I or I to J. Apologies for that. But if you see a little J, it's the imaginary number as well. It's the square root of minus one. OK. So and if I've got all those three things in series, I just add all three together, OK? And I can put in any values of R, C and L that I want. So you now have all of series circuits in the bag, done. It's just adding those things together. What about parallel circuits, OK? Well, actually not very difficult at all. You need a few pieces of information. One. Keep in mind Ohm's law, V equals IR, just keep that in mind. The next law you need is Kirchhoff's law, i.e. Uh, currents in a closed loop sum to zero. So you don't accumulate currents in a wire, uh, is another way to think about it. What that tells you, and um, you know, we sort of move through this fairly quickly, but what that tells you is that uh, the voltage or the, the voltage drop across resistor one uh, and across resistor two must be the same. So I1 R1 equals I2 R2. And what that means is we can construct, or what that allows us to do is use that information to construct an equivalent resistor, REQ. Okay. And what we want to know is if we know R1 and we know R2, and they're a pair of parallel resistors, what would the value of REQ be? Well, we know the value of I in the second circuit. We know the value of I through this circuit 
we, which is the same as the value of i through once this thing comes back to being a single wire again before it branches, it must be the sum of i1 and i2, okay? Because that's Kirchhoff's law. So we know i is the same here as it is here, sort of definitionally. And once you know that, actually you just do a little bit of algebra. Um, and what it turns out to, what it results in, is, and many of you will be familiar with this, that it's this inverse sum of the inverse impedances or resistances. So if you had the resistances one and two as your two resistors, then your impedance of your system would be one over one plus one over two, which is three over two, all to the power of minus one, which is two over three. So two thirds, okay? Um, and that would make sense. If you've got a one ohm and a two ohm, your equivalent resistance is two thirds of an ohm. And the reason for that is that, yes, one ohm and two ohms are both quite big obstacles in your path, but you've now got two paths. So having those two paths, even though they've got big obstacles, is easier than just having one path on its own. So there's a sort of intuitive sense to why it's an, it's an inverse sum of inverses. And crucially, this isn't just about resistors. You notice that I didn't use the squiggly line for the resistor, I used a little box. I tricked you. Uh, the, the, these are for any component, okay? And so this rule would still apply. So it doesn't matter whether it's resistors, capacitors, inductors, or whatever. So now, if you want an equivalent impedance for parallel uh, arbitrary impeding components, it's just this uh, parallel resistors, some people often call it, but it's the inverse sum of inverses or the, the, the harmonic mean of the two. So let's try and let's try and use that approach uh, in our framing of the equivalent circuit for in, in our framing of a resistor and a capacitor in parallel with each other. So I just drop straight in using that Z equivalent, the one over R plus one over I omega C to the power of minus one. So it's a, it's a sort of a one over a one over, and then the whole thing to the power of minus one. And I multiply that by I tilde and that equals V tilde. And you know, now, now that we've got this nice uh, Fourier transform of current formulation of our impedance, you know, actually that was the impedance. Right, you, you only have to divide both sides by R to recover the, the, the term you want. So the, the thing that's to the power of minus one, that whole object is the impedance of the system. If you like rearranging algebra, then fill your boots. You can endlessly rearrange this thing. Okay, here's a bunch of them. So, you know, sometimes it's helpful and sometimes it's, it's not. Um, so if you want to make them one fraction, then have both of them be over R. So multiply the right-hand side bit by R over R. And then you've got that, and then you flip it over. And then again, you want, want to realize your fraction. So if you've got this bit over here, on the bottom, it's got a full complex number, one plus I omega RC. And if you want to make that into a real number, you can multiply top and bottom by its complex conjugate, which would be one minus I omega RC. Uh, and that would result in this thing over here. And there is one more step that you might choose to do. This. So, you know, everything here, each one of these equalities, because I've written the equal sign, they are exactly the same thing. They're just me writing the same equation or writing the same expression in, in five different ways, you know, and, and hopefully not just to be a bore, but also because it is quite helpful. This last formulation here, I've separated up in a very particular way. Okay, notice they've both got the same denominator of the fraction, okay, here, but I've chopped the top into, into two separate fractions. One just gets this R, and the second one, I've taken also the minus I out and put it down here, and then left the uh, omega r squared c on top. And what this formulation does is has a real component, this is just real numbers, and an imaginary component, 
So all of this is imaginary. And for those of you who've you know, looked at Nyquist plots before, those plots are of the complex plane with a real axis and a, an imaginary axis. And so splitting it up like this is very handy. And so that brings us to Nyquist plots. Um, and I think now is probably a good moment to have a pause as we've been going for 45 minutes. Um, so has anyone got any questions? You're welcome to shout out loud or, or type it into the chat. Um, before, and, and we're going to take a sort of maybe, Ivan, I don't know what, or, or Clotilde, what, what do you recommend? A sort of five or ten minute break at this point? That really as you wish. I mean, maybe we can do ten minutes, yeah? Ten minutes? I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I think but, but that, that's, that's what a lecture would be like normally. Uh, so if anyone's got a question, you're very welcome to ask at this point. Um, yeah, about any of the steps we've gone through so far. I really hope that I've managed to keep most of you with me to this point, uh, because that's actually most of the hard stuff done. You've got these nice uh, simplified expressions for each component, each of the classic components. And, uh, you know, if you want them in series, you just add them. And if you want them in parallel, you do the uh, inverse sum of inverses, and and, th and that's it. Um, and that gets you, you know, such a wide range of circuits, and now uh, tractable to you. Okay, so we're gonna we'll, we'll that that means I think we should probably reconvene. Uh, I'll start again at one. So let's let's reconvene again just before. Let's reconvene again just before one. Okay, right. I'm going to have a go at some drawing, but before I do, oh, uh, we had a question from Soren, uh, and I'm like, how does the potential stat actually measure the real imaginary parts of impedance? And but it looks like we've got an answer from Apostolos. Uh, I imagine the potential stat is just measuring the impedance real part and reactance imaginary part in that case, but would be happy to hear more from the lovely speaker. That's very sweet. Excellent question. Um, so, full disclosure, I I'm very much a theoretician and, and have never actually touched a potential stat. Um, but but I do have some idea of what's going on. And so I've come back to this first slide. Excuse me. And you have clearly your potential stat, and this is obviously sort of diving way down the path a bit, but your potential stat is measuring or taking measurements at a variety of frequencies and it does them usually not always actually but usually sequentially so it'll do let's measure the impedance at this frequency let's measure the impedance at this frequency okay so at any given moment in a conventional potential step it is injecting a sinusoidal voltage of known frequency and known amplitude okay now something crucial to bear in mind is that um, the system starts from rest, if you want, right? The system uh, starts from not having a current at all, and you go, bang, here's a, here's a voltage, off you go. And it takes actually a while for uh, this response current to settle down, okay? Imagine that you are, are sort of, what's a nice example i don't know like sort of wiggling wiggling a rope initially it's a bit chaotic it takes some time before it starts to fall into a fixed relationship with the motions of your driving force of your hand okay initially it sort of flaps all over the place and so your potential stat when it applies this sinusoidal voltage initially the current that comes out is all over the place so it has to apply enough cycles such that it believes that the current has settled down into its steady state in the frequency domain, steady state response. Okay, and this is of course a, a sort of limiting step on in terms of how quickly you can measure the response. Um, and uh, you know, as you know, measuring a full impedance spectrum can take a long time, and that's part of the reason why you have to do many cycles at any particular frequency in order to have uh, sort of to minimize the um, unsteady component of your um, exponentially decaying. Uh, ringing when you start the measurement. Um, that being said, how does it measure it? So, so 
I'm fairly confident in saying that it doesn't do what you might imagine it does in terms of like a speaker. So a speaker to measure, you know, frequencies in the air takes lots of little points, dot, 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 of the pressure signal and plots out a, um, oh, sorry, a microphone, plots out a, a sinusoid and, and, and very, has very rapid fitting of that to extract. But I think rather than doing that digitally with the signal, you can instead do that with power electronics. So you actually just directly infer the impedance from the power electronics set up in the box. But I've never built one. Uh, and so uh, that could all be out the window by now. Maybe that's all old news and there's some clever way of doing it that I'm missing out on. Uh, but I, hopefully that gives you some idea that it's like there's a, there's a lot to take into account here. And actually the uncertainty in your impedance measurement, i.e. the expected error that you're going to find, is a function of the frequency that you're measuring and the resistance of your system. OK, uh, and so at different frequencies, the, your potential stat would prefer you to have different real components in order to accurately measure the, the imaginary component. So you really shouldn't just measure an impedance. You really need to look at the machine and look at the handbook and it gives you a plot of the uncertainty as a function of uh, the frequency of your measurements. Usually you would have bought one appropriate to your discipline, but if you're measuring something unusual, it may be that the potential step that you're using is simply not able to take that measurement. Certainly they all have very high, um, they all have cutoffs at certain high frequencies where they just are no longer able to record meaningful measurements. Okay. So we're now on the iPad, so apologies if this is a bit more chaotic. Um, right. So now we've got uh, the knowledge to do components in series and components in parallel. We understand that the impedance is the ratio of the frequency domain uh, voltage and, and current. Uh, and I've corrected my typos. And so now let's take that knowledge and get to the, the, the point that you'll see in papers, which is Nyquist plots. OK, these are parametric plots. What does it mean? Well, um, uh, often you'll be familiar with a plot that might be speed as a function of time. So you put in a time and you get a speed. These plots aren't quite like that. These plots are parameterized in terms of omega and both of the axes are a function of omega okay so you could even imagine and that's actually some nice papers have this a three-dimensional graph where the third axis is omega and your impedance is a path through that 3d space which is nice so it's like a bode two different bode plots and an iquis plot all slapped together so it's a parametric plot so every point you say okay this is omega therefore what is my x-axis coordinate what is my y-axis coordinate they are conventionally drawn with the negative axis inverted, which is very irritating. So, so sorry, with the vertical axis negative. Um, so it's flipped over vertically. And a notational simplification or convention that the real component of the impedance Z is often written as Z prime. That's not the derivative, that's just saying just the real bit. And the imaginary component of the impedance Z is often written as Z double prime. And both of those things have the units of ohms, although it's sometimes slightly uncomfortable to think of an imaginary number having a unit, but they very much do, uh, but their interpretation is a bit subtle. And so this graph has axis minus Z double prime versus Z prime, okay? And that is almost all impedance plots you'll ever see. Why is the vertical axis negative? because most of the time the things that you're interested in are capacitances and they would have negative imaginary components. So it saves us from always having to draw the axis at the top and go down. Instead, we make it negative and, and, and draw up. OK, so it's just a, a useful convention. So now it's time for us to have a go at some plotting. And I'm sure any of you who've been doing lectures or meetings during the pandemic have seen that this could be a bit of a pain, but we will overcome. So uh, I want to draw the impedance spectrum of a resistor, okay? And I think it's important to do the obvious ones just so we don't skip over them. I want to draw a graph, this parametric plot, that shows me all of the different values of Z i.e. Z prime and minus Z double prime, as we change omega, the frequency, 
for a circuit that just has a resistor. Can you please all just make sure that you've got a vision in your head for what this graph is going to look like? What is this graph going to look like? What is the impedance of just a resistor? OK, and now I will ruin the surprise. And the graph looks like this. All of the, I don't know why that's a P, all of the different frequencies all have the same value. It doesn't, doesn't change anything. As you can see, Z subscript R, the impedance of a resistor, is just R. It's not a function of omega. So all of the points sit on top of each other in this graph. Doesn't matter what your value of frequency is, Z has the same value, and that is it's all real. There are no I's in that formulation either. So it just sits on the real axis. It's got no imaginary component. It's just R. Okay? That's the easy one, obviously. What about just a capacitor? Okay, what about just a capacitor? Well, often we don't want to have imaginary numbers on the bottom of a fraction. It can be a bit of a pain. So instead, we might rewrite this as if we multiply top and bottom by I, we get I on the top, um, and on the bottom we get minus omega C. And so that's probably more conveniently rewritten as minus I times brackets one over omega C. Okay, and now you can immediately see what I'm talking about. Why do we want the vertical axis to be the negative of the imaginary component? Well, because all of our capacitive bits are going to be negative bits. So how do we plot this? What happens as the value of omega? Uh, well, here's another question. All doesn't matter what values of omega and C, and we're going to assume that omega and C are both all positive real numbers. Your frequencies and your capacitances are all positive real numbers. OK, they can be zero as well. OK, so that's that's the first assumption, which is absolutely how the universe seems to work. That being true. All values of this are going to be imaginary only. There will be no real component of this. So we can immediately say that all the impedance spectrum will sit on the vertical axis. It won't take any forays into the positive um, real space. OK. As omega goes towards infinity, so lim as omega goes towards infinity of Zc is going to be, well, as omega gets very large, that fraction is going to get very small, so it's going to go towards zero. And the limit as omega goes towards zero of Zc is that this thing is going to, is going to head off to uh, minus i times infinity. OK? So I'm going to draw a bunch of points on my graph here. And it's often useful to annotate and say, well, when the impedance is zero, that is when omega is going to infinity. And when the impedance goes off up here, that is when omega is going to zero. So it's just a vertical line. OK. OK. We haven't given inductors much love, so let's do that now. Uh, what's the graph of this thing look like? Try and talk yourself through it just now. What happens when omega goes to um, zero, when omega equals zero, ZL equals zero? OK, fine, we're here. And that's omega equals zero. And when omega goes to infinity, oops, this thing is going to go to I infinity, complex infinity. OK, and that's positive. So this thing is a another straight line on the vertical axis only. But this time it goes down from the bottom and you can see that that from my capacitor zero starts at the top and goes, uh, sorry, omega goes to zero at the top and to infinity at the bottom. And the same thing is true with uh, an inductor, but they just start from different places, if you know what I mean. So so still the, the highest value, if you want, is, is near the top of the graph, but then it goes off as it gets to infinity. As omega goes to infinity, it goes down. And that's useful 
to keep in mind. Okay, so that's the sort of three classics, the three trivial ones. What about for a series combination of a resistor and a capacitor? Notice I've drawn a capacitor and then a resistor, and this is something that's going to be really crucial and we'll talk about a bit later, but the spatial ordering of a series of components is irrelevant, right? Components in series all experience the same current at the same time, so the spatial ordering is an irrelevance. Okay, well, we solved this problem already using our Fourier series just before the break, uh, Fourier uh, transform just before the break, and we even rearranged it in a nice way um, such that it had a real bit and um, imaginary bit. Okay, so now how do we draw this one? Right, well, this thing, just to write out even more explicitly, is R minus I times one over omega ooh, C. Uh, yeah, that's an omega for, the, for anyone who's not sure. It's R minus, it's R minus I times one over omega C, okay? That means that the real component for for any value of omega or any value of c is always just r. Someone is at my door. Two seconds. Think about that graph. Get that graph going in your head. What does it look like? Try and draw it. If it's one of you that just sent me flowers, that was very quick, uh, it was very sweet of you. Okay, right. You've got the real bit is just R in all scenarios. And the complex bit is this slightly more interesting function of omega, one over omega C. So, okay, what happens when omega goes to infinity? It's the, it's the same analysis that we were doing last time. So as omega goes to infinity, we just say, well, this thing, it goes to r minus i multiplied by one over it's going to infinity so it's going to go to zero so it's going to go to just go to r z equals r and as omega goes to zero z okay you, this thing what's going to happen well, it's going to be equals r minus sort of i infinity and you realize i'm using sort of slightly sloppy notation around limits but you'll, you you get my point okay uh well, there's a question coming up. Okay, it's a fine. It's an answer. It's an answer from Ed. Thanks, Ed. Okay, and so we can we can now plot this already. Okay, so here is R, and as we increase our value of omega, this negative imaginary component is just showing up. So now we've got a vertical line over here, and it's good to put on your frequency. So this is as R goes to, sorry, sorry as omega goes to infinity, and this is as omega goes to zero okay so it's just a vertical line but it's been displaced okay and keep that in mind we've seen on these other two examples that r was just a point on the real axis c was a vertical line on the imaginary axis and the series combination of those two is this displaced vertical line so that actually gives us a clue for some future ones that we're going to do where if you add an r in series to something you just shift it along the horizontal axis. You just shift it along the real axis by the value of R. Okay. What about a parallel RC circuit? Okay. Parallel RC circuit um, should be appearing on your screen, but it's not appearing on mine. Uh, okay. Here we go. Okay. Parallel RC circuit. So we've done the maths already. And I even just before the break finished by saying, let's arrange it in this very particular way to have all the real bits here and all the negative complex bits here. And I hope now you can see why we're bothering, why we bothered to do that. Okay. So just like the other times, let's start by analyzing 
key points. So the key point we're going to analyze first is as omega goes to zero, what's going on? When omega is going to zero, what have we got? Well, the real bit just becomes r over one plus zero, right? r over one plus zero. So it's just r. And what happens to the imaginary bit? Minus i times zero over one plus zero, zero over one, zero. So it just equals r. So as your frequency goes towards zero, your impedance of this quite complicated little circuit is just r, just the real value r. So here is r. So that's one of the points, and this can be omega goes to zero. What about as omega goes to infinity, our next most sort of obvious point to analyze, to scrutinize? What happens there? OK, and again, apologies for the robust mathematicians amongst you. I'm going to use quite informal approach to, to limits. Well, the real component is R over one plus infinity squared. So R divided by a very large number. The real part is going to go to zero. OK, minus I times what's going to happen to this imaginary part. So as we go to infinity, we get infinity times some stuff plus Oh, sorry, divided by one plus infinity squared. So, so you know, again, avoiding robustness for a second, the denominator wins this battle. It becomes one over omega and omega is going to infinity. It becomes uh, zero. So actually, the impedance of this thing at, as frequency goes to infinity is zero. OK, so we've got two points so far and they're both just on the real axis okay what do we do next now there is different answers to that question depending on what you do but if, if you're you know not fussed about why then what you do is just write that equation directly into your favorite coding language and it will plot you the result okay but we can do a bit better than that today we're going to analyze one particular um, value of frequency and it's called the characteristic frequency. In fact, it's not a goes to at all, it's an equals. There's one frequency here that is different from the others. OK. And that frequency is one over RC, RC to the minus one. One over RC. Why is that different from the others? Well, if you sub in omega equals one over rc if you look at the equations most of the time omega is being multiplied by rc so rc multiplied by one over rc is just one okay so if we try and do this z would equal r over one plus one over rc times rc which is one squared one squared is one so one plus one is two so r over two is the real component minus i times and again same analysis here so omega is one over rc so this is r squared c over rc so that's just r on the top and what about the bottom well it's the same as the other one two okay so we've now got this particular point it's r over 2, which is here. And it's also r over 2 here. r over 2. OK, so we've got this point here. And we can do this, and shall we? Well, you can investigate as many points as you wish, right? But what you will see is that this thing is actually a beautiful little slightly skewy semicircle. OK. And uh, that's very satisfying. And so actually, 
you know, if you crush down out of the impedance maths and just turn this into sort of regular graphing, this is just the parametric equation for a circle displaced from the origin. OK, that's where these sort of squared bits come from. And so if you had negative frequencies, you could com complete the other side of the circle, but you don't. Um, so this is as omega goes to infinity. And this was when omega equals rc to the minus one. And we call that point, you know, you can see it's like the, it's it's the most unreal. It's the, it's the highest value of the imaginary component. It's the characteristic frequency. This is omega subscript C, the character frequency. Or you could also use tau, which is the time constant, the characteristic time constant. And frequency and time have this inverse relationship. So tau is just equal to RC. And if you look at RC, the units of resistance ohms and the units of capacitance farads, you multiply those together. You do just get seconds. I, I promise you do. So it's quite that's quite a fun little exercise to work through. OK, so so by working through this like second order heterogeneous ODE analysis, we Fourier transform it, we frame it in terms of currents, we analyze it, we understand Kirchhoff's law so that we can do parallel systems. We work all that together and we end up with a formulation that if we spit it into real and imaginary, actually drawing the graphs is quite straightforward. Um, and often there's a bit of a trick, you know, well, not so much a trick, but you have to remember to look for the um, characteristic frequencies, but even just by looking at the equations, now that you've seen one, hopefully they'll seem relatively obvious to you. You know, quite nice to see that omega times RC, all right, how do we get, how do we simplify that? Make omega one over RC, what could be easier? Okay, so if you measure the impedance spectrum of this thing, you'd get points like this all along your semicircle. Okay. Any, any questions at that point? Characteristic frequencies, why frequencies should always be included on a plot. That is how you see capacitance, and that's that I need to stress that point. Let's go back to this graph. There's such an important point here, and I hope it would like, you know, exactly what the electrochemical network is for, hopefully, is part of this, which is you must report frequencies on your Nyquist plots. Okay? Otherwise, you've got no idea what your capacitances are when you look at them. For example, with this plot. OK, if we look at this plot here. It doesn't matter what my value of C is. You will always have the graph that is a semicircle between zero and R. For any value of C. OK, only by showing the frequencies do you show your value of C. You know, when you look at the way this is formulated, well, it, it's just R and, and R over two. Right. It's only by reporting omega C or tau C or just reporting your log space frequencies on your uh, diagram. Can the reader have any insight into what the capacities capacitances are? And that I think that's so important. And so often you'll look at a paper, especially as a reviewer, and be like, I don't know what's going on here because I've got no insight into what kind of processes you'd be measuring because you haven't reported your frequencies. OK. Um, Yes. Right. OK, so we're sort of almost at the home straight now. In fact, we are. This is the home straight. Welcome. You've made it to the home straight. I have made I, I love this topic, as you can probably gather. So I've made some animations that, that show the circuit that you can see in this image. And so this is the key bit that I really want to dwell, dwell on, and I really want you guys to have like a predictive feel for what's about to happen. Look at the circuit I've shown. It's a resistor followed by two parallel RCs. OK. I've given a value for each component. Half an ohm, two ohms, one ohm, one farad and a two thousandth of a farad. OK. I've drawn the Nyquist plot for that circuit and you can see the legend in the top. OK, my green line is the actual uh, response of this circuit and the distance between each little cross in my green line is, is sort of root two, um, uh, root two log spaces, so root two omega. 
Okay, so this, this, it's, a, it's a geometric series. It's multiplied by root two every time it is. Okay. I've also drawn a green circle around one particular point, and that point is one hertz. Okay. And in addition, I've drawn the semicircles for the first RC and the second RC, RC1 and RC2. Now, a bunch of things to remember. One is, I told you that the order of components in series is irrelevant to the plotting of impedance spectrum. So I could put the shift the blue parallel pair all the way to the left, have the resistor alone in the middle, and then have the red ones on the right. It wouldn't change the diagram. Really important to remember that. Okay, some people might look at this and say, hang on, why is the red one first, then the blue one in the circuit, but the blue one first, and then the red one in the Nyquist plot? I hope you could answer that question now. Okay, what's going on here? So if we look at, and, and, the, and the answer to that question is characteristic frequencies or, or characteristic time constants. So notice I've also reported the characteristic frequencies of those two parallel RC pairs um, that are in series with each other. And I've converted those into tau's, so parallel times. So, you know, the time constant of the red one is two times one two seconds and the time constant of the blue one is one times 0 0.0005 so 0 0.005 seconds okay so there's a lot of information to take in there and the last thing to really make sure that you're very comfortable with is look at the frequencies omega goes to infinity on the left and omega goes to zero on the right okay we've got two semicircles and and look at the point where they meet Right. And the first thing I suppose, the other thing to note is this point here. It should be no surprise to you that this point here is at 0 0.5 because that is squarely the result of that resistor there. OK, so it's just shifted everything to the to the right. Another piece of analogy, whether it's springs or water wheels or whatever, I, I like the water wheel one personally. OK. If you've got a very big capacitance. If you've got a really big capacitance, it's like a very soft elastic membrane in the way. You don't even you don't even notice it, right? Okay. And if you've got a very small capacitance, it's like a very stiff membrane in the way. That's one thing to think about. The next bit, and I, I appreciate I'm really laboring the point here, but I'm about to make this come to life. So I'm about to animate this diagram with, in a very particular way, and I really would love you to preempt what it's about to do. I want you to guess correctly what on earth is about to happen in this diagram. The next thing to consider is that um, why is the blue on the left and the red on the right? Well, the red has a higher time constant or a lower frequency constant, characteristic frequency, than the blue. That's, that's what's going on here. So what's going on? As we have when we have a uh, very high frequency, resist, sorry, capacitors are like short circuits at a very high frequency. They're just like a wire. Capacitors don't care at all about a very high frequency, like a spring. If you just want to go backwards and forwards very, very quickly, the spring doesn't care about that at all. Neither does the little membrane in the pipe. Neither does a capacitor. If you want to go backwards and forwards very, very quickly, it's invisible. It becomes a wire, okay? So at our highest frequencies, this circuit becomes, so as omega goes to infinity, this circuit becomes a resistor of 0.5 ohms. And that is what's going on. At very, very low frequencies, your spring or your water pipe membrane or your capacitor, that they've been stretched to their limits because your sinusoid is changing so slowly that from its perspective, it's like, oh, you've been pushing in the same direction for ages, okay? So in as you go to very low frequencies, and of course at zero frequency is analogous to steady state, it's, it's DC, not AC. As you go to very, very low frequencies, your capacitor becomes a, a block. It stops you going through that path. So it becomes an open circuit. So as omega, goes to zero, your circuit becomes 
three series resistors. Okay, 0 0.5, 2, and 1. And that's what you see. That's this point here, 3.5, as you get to zero frequency. It's only the frequencies in between, and of course everything is in between zero, and well, half of all the things are in between zero and infinity, where something interesting happens. Okay, and that is thing only interesting, only interesting things only happen when you are around the characteristic frequencies of the behaviors. And that's the whole point of impedance. You're investigating the, the processes by having some insight into their characteristic frequencies. Okay, and so as it stands, these two processes have quite significant separation between their two characteristic frequencies right, or time constants, either way, right, 2 and 0.005, there's a big gap between them, which means that as you start from very, very high frequency, very, very high frequency, and you, you, just, you just see one resistor, as you slow that frequency down, you first start to experience a bit of resistance from the, the, blue, resi the blue capacitor. The blue capacitor starts to say, whoa, you're going a bit slow here. It's a bit slow for my liking here. So you start to see some current having to go through the blue resistor. And then uh, still the red capacitor is like, whoa, this everything's so fast, I don't care, I'm just a wire. And then as you go slower still, the red capacitor starts to say, whoa, that's a bit slow. You're going to have to send some of that current through the resistor because I, I, you know, I'm not going to let everything through. And so you start to experience the red resistor. OK, that's what's going on. That's why you've got two separated processes. And that's only because they're only separated because the two time constants are very far apart. But if the two time constants got a bit closer to each other, those two moments when the capacitors say, oh, I, I'm now aware of like there's a process going on here, they start to overlap. OK, and they don't overlap the semicircles, but they blur what's going on. What They blur which processes is which process is responsible for which response, okay? So what I'm about to do, that was a long build up, but what I'm about to do is um, change one value. I'm gonna start to slowly increase by a factor of two each time, I think every half second I'll multiply by two, the parameter C2, okay? I'm just gonna change C2, everything else stays constant. And I want you to try and predict what's going to happen. So I'm going to keep increasing C2. Eventually, I'm going to increase C2 so much that its value will be um, 2 farads. And when the value is 2 farads, tau 2 will also have the value of 2 seconds, just like tau 1. Even though they've got different resistor capacitor combinations, the product of them, 2 times 1 and 1 times 2, gives you the same time constant. They'll have the same time constant, and you won't be able to tell that there are even two processes going on at all. You will have no way to know. OK, so hopefully this animation works, and I want you to watch this process. Only thing I'm changing is C2. Did you see that moment there where the time constants were the same? OK. And now C2 continues to increase, and then I'm going to start reducing it. Here we go, we're going to go in the opposite direction. I'm reducing C2 by a factor of two each time. You see the time constants moving towards each other, and bang, they're the same. So those semicircles are kind of only to guide your eye as a reader about the fact that there are two processes. Okay, those two semicircles in many electrochemical measurements would be one of these mushy, you know, two slightly blurred together semicircles. The semicircles themselves never overlap. But I imagine a kind of like there's a sheet over the top of them and you kind of sort of blow a puff of air under that sheet and it sort of starts to lift the actual response, which is the green line, off those two semicircles. And crucially, at the point where they have the same time constant, it looks like one big semicircle. And so if you've got two processes, let's say one's a bit of kinetics and one's a bit of transport, and they happen to have the same time constant, very difficult to have any insight into that in impedance. So you better hope they don't have the same Arrhenius behavior and then if, and then you can change the temperature and measure it again. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed that. That's the, that's the sort of the, the, what, what we've been building to. That was the kind of cool bit. Uh, 
There is another component, which I'll talk about in a second, called CPEs, but basically the logic is all the same. In fact, yeah, let's talk about it now. There's this component called a CPE, a constant phase element. Um, and a constant phase element has this formulation. So, you know, imagine this is the thing that would go in front of the current term. And it's got two parameters. All the other components we've seen so far had one parameter, you know, R, resistance, C, capacitance, L, uh, um, inductance. This thing has got two parameters. It's got Q and alpha. OK, and it's slightly weird and it, it gets it's quite a contentious. Uh, it's quite a source of contention in the literature because just by having two parameters, it becomes quite flexible and maybe too flexible. So let's just think about this. As alpha goes to zero, when alpha is zero, Z C P E P E goes to what? Well, it's one over Q naught. Uh, I omega to the power of zero is, is, is one. Anything to the power of zero is one. So it's just, you know, times one. So this is just this, which you can think. So so when alpha is zero, when your, your exponent term for your frequency is zero, you just have um, a resistor. It's just got a real value. You can think of this as just a resistor. OK, what about when alpha is one? OK, Z, C, P, E. Well, this would then be one over Q, zero, I, omega. Well, that's just like a capacitor. OK, that's just like one over I, omega, C. So a CPE can recreate two of our favorite components, one a resistor, the other one a capacitor. OK, but it can also do stuff in between. OK, and so you can have alpha as anything between. These values and let's look at one particular one, alpha equals 0 0.5 as uh, alpha equals 0 0.5. OK, what happens there? Well, it's one over Q naught uh, I. Oh, well, the square root of I omega, right? That's 0 0.5. OK, what's that? Well, what does it look like on a plot? And it looks like this. It looks like a diagonal line, so it's got a constant phase relationship, which is why it's called a constant phase, because this is your phase angle here. OK. And of course, each of the values of alpha between zero and one give you a different angle of that line. Uh, alpha equals 0 0.5. One way to think about this, FYI, uh, and you know you can look at the frequency relationship as frequency gets very big this thing goes small so this is omega goes to infinity and this is omega goes to zero um and okay what else well this thing is quite fun because it's at each different frequency you get some more as your frequency is changing you get a bit more capacity but you also have to pay a resistive cost for that. So it's a combination of a resistor and a capacitor in a sense. You, you, you do store energy in the system, but you pay to store that energy with some resistance. Um, and people say they don't have a physical meaning. None of them have a physical meaning. All of the components are idealized. None of the idealized components can be built. Well, maybe a superconductor has zero resistance, but you, you see my point. They're all idealizations. So there's no worries about getting particularly stressed about a CPE being made up because they're all made up. OK, it's just what you do with them that's that's interesting and how you choose to interpret them in terms of me mechanisms. When an alpha equals 0.5, some of you might be aware that a 45 degree slope is often associated with diffusive type processes. And that there's a there's a lot of maths uh, that uh, I could talk about another day that explains why that is. And so. Uh, uh, this is a Warburg diffusion element with a semi-infinite boundary condition. OK, there are three types of Warburg. Warburgs that are a finite length of material that you've got to diffuse through. Warburgs that are a finite length of material that is blocked at one end and so that you get in, but it gets full after a while. And Warburgs that are semi-infinite. 
Alpha equals 0.5 of a CPE, that is a semi-infinite war book. And that's you know, a bit more involved than we're going to go into today. But let's go back to that uh, the, the, the animation. So you tend to draw CPEs as two little, slightly crooked, like two arrows, although they don't have a directionality, but two arrows. And here I've just chosen some arbitrary values. I've said, you know, uh, I've set Q0 to 1 and 0 0.039. And I've set alpha to 0.8 and 0.4, and I've kept all the R's the same as the last example. And you can calculate time constants for, for CPEs, even though they've got a weird uh, power next to their frequency, you just undo that power. So the time constant of a, of a, of a CPE is just RQ to the power of 1 over alpha. It's the alpha th root of RQ. OK, let's watch it go. So all I'm doing is just changing the the Q coefficient of the second CPE. OK, still the time constants come back and sit. And when the time constants are separated, it's two separate processes. But as the time constants start to move back together again, they turn into one weird process. Look, it's sort of inside the red semicircle for a bit. Very strange. And the initial angle, so if you look at where the, uh, let's go back to the non-animated version. Uh, the initial angle, for example, here, the tangent of the point here, that is, uh, corresponds to this alpha thing here, where the flat line will be zero and a vertical line will be one. And so 0 0.4 is, you know, this is 0 0.5. And so 0 0.4 is here, which is what you see. And this one is, Oops, sort of 0.8, so that's here. And so uh, you can often think about it as a, people call it a depressed semicircle, which I think is a rather disheartening name, but it is a semicircle that has been not squished, but pushed so that its center is below the horizontal axis. And so the tangent to it at the intersection of the horizontal axis is uh, corresponds to the value of alpha when you normalize to one and zero. Okay, let's watch that again, because I really love these. Okay. So you get this blend of processes. I mean, there's so much going on there. If you want to interpret that spectrum, it's very, very sort of uh, confusing to try and work out what would be going on at one of those intermediate systems. It looks like you've got all kinds of things. OK. Uh, there is a few. So that is basically it. That's as far as I want to go today. But all I want to say in the last few minutes is just a few cool concepts that you might be interested in hearing more about on another day. Distribution of relaxation times, known to its friends as DRT, is instead of having a graph of uh, I, uh, Z double prime versus Z prime, you have a graph of gamma versus tau, where tau is just time, but like a normalized time, time constant time. And, and gamma is, well, and instead of having, um, uh, this parametric plot, you've now got a, a conventional plot, so you're just going along, to, and at different processes will occur at different time constants. And it's very tempting because it's like, unlike a Nyquist plot, which is a sort of model of semicircles, this thing is like, ah, there is a process here at this time, there is a process here at this time, and there is a process here at this time. Sounds good, doesn't work in practice very often because you need incredible uh, frequency resolution in order to extract DRT spectrum with any confidence. And you have to do all kinds of things like ticking off regularization to smooth out your curves of all the bits that you haven't measured. And your noise propagates through terribly. So it is lovely in principle, and they are lovely if you're a theoretician and have infinite resolution, but actually in practice, they don't necessarily offer you any more insight. What they risk doing is offering you false insight because you have to apply some interpolation to get your EIS data into DRT data. And that can sometimes make you think you've seen a thing that you have not. Um, there are often uh, equ equivalent circuits, and so equ equivalent equivalent circuits. And so you can recreate the behavior of that 45 degree CPE element that I showed you with an infinite series of resistors and capacitors in this, in this configuration. There's almost always another way to think about a circuit. Um, and, and that applies to DRT, in fact, yeah, and, and that, that's a really interesting topic where you could you could think about this, uh, the, the, the framing of DRT as, and this is going to take too long to draw, but um, resistor capacitor, resistor capacitor or capacitor resistor, uh, 
okay and you just have if you have lots of these and they all stuck together in an infinitely long chain which would take too long to draw what you can imagine on the nyquist plot is this has got little tiny delta r little tiny delta r little tiny delta r this is c1 c2 c3 c4 if c1 c2 c3 c4 are all really far apart from each other they're very different values of capacitance but r delta r is always the same it's some small amount of r then your impedance response would just be semicircle, 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 semicircle all the way. Lots of little delta R's. Each one, as you move through the frequencies, experiences the next component, not in their order, although we often put them in time order. But as those values of C, if all of the values of C were the same, then you would get this spectrum. And the concept is that, of course, depending on those little values of C and depending on very small values of delta R, you could create almost any weird thing you wanted in the envelope between many separate circles and one big circle you could almost recreate anything i mean it has to it has to obey certain rules and so one way of formulating your drt analysis is to think of it as an infinite series or a very long series but finite actually of of little delta r parallel rc components which is quite common uh gary Scher, uh, you often see them and they sort of look like a hedgehog okay and this is uh i've showed you warber which i mentioned was the solution to a uh, diffusion equation gerisher is a solution to a reaction diffusion equation so not only are you perhaps moving through an electrode but you're also reacting at the surface and disappearing into it and that's 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 beyond what we want to talk about today but you'll see these more elaborate components pop up and they are often um Physi very physically motivated. So think about a particular set of equations and some mathematician would have said, oh, I, I can solve that set of equations and give you an analytical solution. And that is worth mentioning that, you know, what's the point of EIS in general and, and equivalent circuits? It's because they all have analytical solutions. Uh, and so analysis of them and fitting of the data is really straightforward. Um, a more general notion of equivalence that I'd like you to think about, although we won't talk about now because we're running out of time, a resistor is just a parallel RC pair where the uh, C has a value of infinity. And a capacitor is just a parallel RC pair where R has gone to infinity. Every circuit you could think of, if you put an R in parallel to that whole circuit and put that R off to infinity, you've changed nothing, right? As R goes to infinity, it's like having an open, an open circuit. OK, so that sounds like a silly thing to say, and it partly is, but it's nice to think of, for example, um, here we've got what we saw before. So we've got a parallel RC. OK, and this is the value of R and this is the value of C. For some arbitrary value of R, we get a semicircle like this. If we increase R, we get a semicircle like this. If we increase R again, we get a semicircle like this. If we keep increasing R, we'll eventually end up with a giant semicircle. And if we tend send R off to infinity, we won't be able to tell whether we're on a vertical straight line, which is just what a capacitor is, or a sort of tangent to an infinitely wide circle. So there's this notion of equivalence that there's always other ways to represent things and make components redundant. And you're looking for the sort of the least redundant version of a system, like a kind of Occam's razor approach where you're not overcomplicated things. In fact, you're battling to try and keep it as simple as possible. And then lastly, in the dying few minutes, just thought I'd share some of my own research. Um, so this is a paper called Simulated Impedance of Diffusion in Porous Media. And this is just, I wrote a little numerical solver that models diffusive transport in arbitrary spaces, and then gives you back the impedance spectra. And the sort of, the, the, the conclusion of that research is, you know, in this second graph here, the, the dense black line with no points on it, that's the analytical Warburg diffusive finite length behavior. Each of those colored lines is from one of the little simple 2D systems above it. And the point is they look really different from the dense black line. And so if you are looking at it, porous media, maybe the reason your impedance spectrum is a bit uh, jaunty is not because you've got some fabulously interesting electrochemical process going on. Maybe it's just because it's a funny shape. 
Okay. And, you know, here we've got two more examples of that. And top, the inset of that graph is um, a little distribution of relaxation times analysis of the same data. So it's, it's, it's the same confident. And this is a porous media that either goes from dense to less dense or vice versa. And also whether it's finite length, which is blocked or finite, or sorry, which is open or finite space, which is blocked. Okay, all more detail than we've talked about today, but might be familiar language to some of you who've been looking at this topic. And then a more recent paper, um, called the electro-tortuosity factor, why conventional tortuosity factor is not well suited to quantifying transport in porous lithium-ion battery electrodes and what to use instead. This is another numerical solver in 3D spaces where you try and understand uh, migrational transport through a pore network that concludes in um, a charging, a capacitive process at the surface, which is a lot like what you do when you're trying to characterize batteries. Um, and we show that, you know, it matters whether your dense layer is near the top or near the bottom, which is no surprise to anyone, but but contradicts a lot of the modeling work that's done. Um, a little scary fact, just to keep you on your toes, that, that uh, the conductivity of copper, for example, drops by 30% if you introduce 0.1% of aluminium into it. So, you know, when someone says, I've got a copper wire, you need to ask them, yes, but, you know, which particular couple? <laughs> um, uh, one thing that's come up quite a lot in, in vibers and discussions is that if you make a symmetrical cell, so you, you, a cell of any kind, but you know, often a fuel cell, you make a symmetrical cell, so you put the same electrode on both sides, and then you do impedance on it. At any given moment, one of your cells is the anode and one of them is the cathode, right? And that keeps reversing, which means one of them is doing the processes that it, it wasn't really designed for doing. One of them is doing sort of the opposite of what it would like to be doing. It, maybe it would like to be reducing oxygen but right now it's produce it's it, it's you know producing oxygen um and so if you analyze your impedance of a symmetrical cell you need to ask yourself which side at any given moment is my response dominant from and uh, am i over interpreting what i'm seeing here um and that is is the end um so thank you very much for your attention and this is a lovely photo from from the past when we all met up uh, of, of the extended electrochemical science and engineering group, although it's a few years ago now. If you've got any questions about impedance, I love talking about it. So uh, please feel free to get in touch. You've got my email address there. Um, and thanks to uh, Ivan, Kotild, Ringnan and, and uh, Anna for inviting me. <laughs>